Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. God in his grace and mercy, is warning the world of his impending judgment. The Bible refers to this judgment as the tribulation in which God will pour out his wrath on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. I have had many people ask the question, how do you know Jesus is returning? And why is today any different than any other time in history? Jesus gives his followers the answer to that question in Luke 21:28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus told his followers that there would be a convergence of Bible prophecy right before his return. Notice Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, Jesus used the plural word things, meaning when you see multiple prophecies converging at the same time, that his return was at the doors, as we read in Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. There can be no denying all these things are beginning to take place. A country devastated. Two months after unprecedented monsoon rains caused a lot of damage across much of Pakistan. Roads, homes and businesses remain underwater in some areas. July's floods affected 33 million people across the country. More than 1,700 people died. But for those who survived, it's been an absolute struggle. Thousands of people are living in makeshift camps with no health facilities, and there's a lack of clean water and food. Since we arrived in these tents, we haven't received much from the government. We don't know where the aid is going. We barely get food once a day, and if we do, it's a fight. Everyone is pushing each other to get just one piece of bread to survive. The National Nutrition Survey says 1.6 million children are in need of urgent treatment for acute malnutrition, especially in the worst affected areas of Sindh and Baluchistan. And the United Nations reports that more than 6 million people no longer have clean sanitation or toilet facilities. Waterborne illnesses, skin conditions and respiratory infections are spreading fast. We are now homeless and in the middle of nowhere. Our houses were swept away. Diseases have attacked us because we're all standing in the water. Every child, woman, young and old person I know is suffering from either diarrhea, malaria or stomach problems and there's no medical care. Pakistan's government says it's run out of money and it's desperately appealing for help. It's trying to secure loans, but there seems to be donor fatigue. Earlier this month, the UN revised its aid appeal from $160 million to $816. UNICEF says it's only received 13% of the money it's trying to raise. The historic flooding caused around $40 billion in damages. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21:11, And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Worried parents are bringing their children to this clinic for treatment. As the cholera outbreak spreads, the very young are among the most at risk. Maintaining stocks of life-saving medical supplies is vital to preventing further deaths. Malawi's cholera crisis began in March after a series of tropical storms. The destruction of infrastructure and contamination of water supplies caused an outbreak that spread across the country. Cholera is also on the rise elsewhere in the world, 
particularly in Haiti and Syria. The World Health Organization is calling for more resources to deal with the crisis. The number of outbreaks has forced them to lower their treatment standards from two doses of vaccine to a single dose. We can't end the pandemic because we're not prepared collectively to put in place the basic human rights of water and sanitation and basic immunization in those areas at risk. Uh, and it's a sad day for us to have to go backwards to go to a one-dose strategy, which is life-saving. It's an emergency measure. Uh, we shouldn't have to do it. And it is purely based on the availability globally of vaccine. Malawi is doing what it can to contain the outbreak. But it's a race against time. Rainy season is set to begin in November, creating conditions when diseases like cholera can spread even faster. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. After a year of brutal drought this winter, NOAA is predicting warmer temperatures in much of the country and below normal pre uh, precipitation in the nation's southern half. That's bad news for the Mississippi River, whose levels are at historic lows. It's an absolutely heartbreaking sight. Mississippi riverbeds, now riverbanks as a result of this deepening drought. On a typical day, the waterline for the Mississippi should be anywhere from 15 to 20 feet above my head. But today, this massive river is now running dangerously low. Tonight, the mighty Mississippi brought to its knees by drought. Massive barges carrying crops or steel slowed or even stuck. If one of these breaks off, you run the risk of having to shut down a whole section. Uh, you do potentially, depending on the severity of where it breaks off. We joined Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander Mary Gilday on the water near New Orleans, where traffic slowed due to the crisis upstream. The problem is especially bad near Memphis, where water levels are dropping to lows not seen in 70 years. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It, it is, it's bad. We know how important this economic impact is mm -hmm. to the United States. The river's low levels could lead to economic crisis. The Mississippi supports a $12.6 billion shipping industry and tens of thousands of jobs. 60% of all grain exported from the United States is shipped on the river. But today, 127 vessels and more than 1,800 barges are backed up at four waterway closures. I mean, I've, I've never seen the river this low before. In Arkansas, the river's dropped so low, farmer Roger Smith had to put his soybean harvest on hold. Now unable to wait any longer and without a storage facility, he can't use the river to move his crop. Causing us to to even lose money, you know, on the crop that we grew. Smith estimates he'll take a nearly $40,000 loss back on the water. With the uh, the current forecast, um, I don't see it getting any better. A problem that deepens as a river disappears. Surviving in Somalia's Betwa city has turned into a dire challenge. Hundreds of thousands of people have poured into the city after severe droughts made their remote villages unlivable. The influx is overwhelming the city, but displaced families say it's better than what they left behind. With nowhere else to go, the United Nations says displaced communities have set up hundreds of scattered camps themselves. Mohammed Adam is struggling to make ends meet. He's been searching for work all day helping people move their belongings. He cares after his mother and younger brothers. But on a good day, he says he earns less than $2. I'm out here from early morning till night. This is the only work I've got. I wish I had better options. The Somali currency, the shilling, is also struggling. Look at our currency. It's worth nothing. This entire bundle of cash is just worth about $40. International aid doesn't always reach those who need it most. The desperation is palpable. Faced with the worst drought in 40 years, scenes of poverty and hunger are becoming more common. Amina is among thousands who beg for food, hoping for sympathy. I have not eaten anything for two days. I've been begging for food, but often there's no response. It's yet another crisis for the government, which is already facing political instability armed groups and a weak economy. Roughly 70 percent of adult Somalis don't have jobs. And for now, there's little hope things will improve soon. 
We are fast approaching a time known as the Tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting, as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes all at record levels of frequency and intensity just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Bill Chaplin is suing the city of Austin, claiming he was fired from his job with the Austin Fire Department for sharing his religious views online. On his personal blog, he wrote that men and women are biologically different and that men should not compete on women's sports teams. And the chaplain, Dr. Andrew Fox, joins us now along with his attorney, Ryan Bangert, from the Alliance Defending Freedom. Dr. Fox, sorry for what you're going through. Tell us a little bit about that moment that you found out you were being fired over this. Well, that's precisely what it was. It was a, a moment where I was fired. Um, it was very surprising, very shocking. Uh, because I'd come uh, from meetings previous to that with uh, the fire chief and his assistant to say that my blog had uh, nothing to do with the fire department and they were not there to censor my writing. So when I was fired, I felt an immediate uh, offense there that my First Amendment rights had been violated of freedom of speech and freedom of religion in something unrelated to my job. You wrote on foxnews.com in an editorial, you said, who gets to decide what views are acceptable and which ones aren't on someone's personal blog? Or will government officials simply start accepting only those who remain completely silent about their faith, political views, or deeply held beliefs? Do you think this is you know, worrisome enough that you want to, I know you're filing a lawsuit, but do you think this is the sign, a sign of things that are happening more broadly, not just in Austin, and this is not an isolated incident, that we're starting to see more and more of this? Well, you know, I could put context to that. Twenty-three years ago, I moved to this country from England as uh, an immigrant on a religious workers' visa as clergy. And then uh, that quickly went to a green card, permanent residence, and then I eventually became a citizen with all of my family. So when I look over the last 23 years, I can say the country I chose to, came to come to live in, to raise my family in and to work in, is certainly not the country that we currently live in today. Things have changed at such a rapid rate. It does seem that government entities are uh, punishing individuals for voicing their First Amendment rights of freedom of speech again and freedom of religion, of which I'm a big advocate of. Ryan, tell us a little bit about the lawsuit. Where does it stand? What do you expect? It's really a shame that a social agenda by the city of Austin is trumping Dr. Fox's constitutional rights. Now, we filed this lawsuit 
We have alleged violations of Dr. Fox's First Amendment right to free speech, right to exercise his religious freely, as well as rights under the Texas Constitution. Uh, and this is a situation where the city of Austin demanded that Dr. Fox recant his beliefs in order to keep his job. Wow. That is not the job of government institutions to tell Americans how to think, especially outside of work. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted in the United States like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also, Hebrews 13, 3, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Since the start of the war in Ukraine back in February, the U.S. military has added an additional 20,000 troops to the European theater, taking the total there to around 100,000. And many of those troops are in Eastern Europe. Only on CBS Mornings, we are getting a look at the U.S. forces closest to the fighting in Ukraine, supporting NATO allies and sending a very clear message to Russia. Charlie Daggett is in Romania for us this morning. Charlie, good morning. Good morning, Tony. Romania is now home to the 101st Airborne Division. It's the first time it's been headquartered here in Europe in nearly 80 years. This is some of the equipment they brought from home. A 777 howitzer ready to roll at any minute. They're specifically trained to deploy on any battlefield in the world within hours. Go, 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 go. Ready to fight. The reason one of America's most elite oh, air assault God. divisions has been sent right here, right now. We join Deputy Commander Brigadier General John Lubis and Colonel Edwin Mathedis, commander of the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, on board a Black Hawk helicopter for an hour's chopper ride to the very edge of NATO territory, around three miles from the border with Ukraine. From the start of the war, Russia advanced from Crimea along the Black Sea to Kherson, aiming to capture port cities like Mykolaiv and Odessa to landlock Ukraine. We're right about here. We're ready to defend every inch of NATO soil. Why is it necessary to have the 101st here? We bring a unique capability. We're a light infantry force, but again, we bring that mobility uh, through our aircraft and our air assaults. We skirt along the Black Sea coast as we head further north. We're roughly 20 miles away from Snake Island, this contentious island that's been fought over between the Ukrainians and the Russians, currently under Ukrainian control.
control. At a forward operating site, we watched as U.S. soldiers and Romanian troops pounded targets in a joint ground and air assault. The tank rounds and artillery fire are real. So is the enemy, meant to recreate the fight against Russian forces in Ukraine. A message to Russia and NATO allies alike, we're here. The real meaning for me to have the American troops here is like if you were to have allies in Normandy before any enemy was there. In all, roughly 4,700 soldiers of the 101st Screaming Eagles from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, have been deployed to reinforce NATO's eastern flank. You've had an opportunity to, to watch, observe, and possibly study the Russians. What do you think of them so far? So we're, uh, we're closely watching them. So we're building uh, objectives to, to practice against that replicate exactly what's going on in Ukraine. We're the closest American unit to the fighting in Ukraine. And what does that feel like? What does that mean? It, uh, it keeps, us on, uh, keeps us on our toes, right? So. Ready to fight tonight is a message that we've heard repeatedly. It's not just about defending NATO territory, but if the fight escalates and NATO partners are under threat, they're fully prepared to cross over into Ukrainian territory if ordered to do so. As Russia's war on Ukraine rages on, there's a new stark warning from U.S. officials claiming Iranian troops on the ground in Crimea are aiding Russian drone strikes, marking the first official accusation of Tehran's direct involvement in Putin's war efforts. Joining us now to break it all down, Russian-born former U.S. defense intel officer and author of Putin's Playbook, Rebecca Koffler, and former State Department deputy special envoy under President Trump. Rebecca, I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask you every single time that we have you on. How worried to, should the U.S. be about this very latest development coming out of Ukraine? Absolutely. Extremely worried, Todd. This is the schizophrenia of the Biden administration's foreign policy. What's happening right now, Biden has pushed uh, Russia and Iran together. Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Iran is trying to get the nuclear capability with the sole intent to be able to target the United States. What could possibly go wrong with this incredibly dangerous alliance for our country? And I'm trying to understand Iran's thinking in all this. Why are they doing it? Is it because they really think it's in their best interest to cozy up to Russia, which is by all estimates, losing this war, is it to throw salt in our face, throw sand in our face, or do they ultimately think this is going to help them with the Biden administration that, quite frankly, has laid down for them when it comes to this Iran nuclear deal? Joe Biden has created a moment of danger and global disarray for us right now. He seems incapable of distinguishing between our allies and our enemies. And uh, it's well over time for Joe Biden to walk away from the JCPOA failed Iran deal Vienna talks. Right now, as we speak, there are Iranian protesters in five weeks of protests demanding their basic human rights. And Joe Biden gives lip service to the Iranian people, he says that he stands with the Iranian people. He tells Ukraine that he stands with Ukraine. But right now, we know that Iran is responsible, this regime is responsible for civilian deaths, both in Iran and in Ukraine. It's time for Joe Biden to take action. And, uh, and we really need him to take action in order to put a greater global security for people all around the world. Rebecca, when we spoke earlier this week, the topic was, will Russia use some sort of nuclear explosion in some way, shape, or form? Unclear what that would be, but the question is, will they? I can't imagine, as we get to the end of this week, involving Iran, which we're all fearful is a nuclear terror organization to begin with. I can't imagine that your thinking on that has improved so that we are like can all relax all of a sudden. Am I right? Well, absolutely, Todd. Joe Biden himself admitted that he brought us on the brink of a nuclear Armageddon. When you bring Iran into the mix, and Iran effectively is becoming an active combatant in this war, uh, Russia can benefit from Iran's ballistic uh, missile capability, which is the most robust in the region. Like Ali said, I 100 percent agree with her. It can have global ramifications. Luke 21, 26 through 28. 
men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives it is only possible because of His grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation, works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith, and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, 
heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. through But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!